Hey, hey, time for some cells. Study guide stuff. All right, microscopes, the way we see cells. So Janssen's, he was the first person to come up with the microscope, or he invented the first microscope. It used natural light. Then Leeuwenhoek came along about 60 years later and improved his lenses. He had a lot of time on his hands. So he got to look at his sperm under the microscope, and he called them caverning wee beasties. That's just a fun fact. Uh, also discovered bacterial shapes, uh, the structures of plant cells, mouth parts of insects. Then comes along Robert Hooke, and he was the first to use artificial light sources, so not natural light, not sunlight. Uh, he actually burned uh, whale oil um, to provide light for his microscopes. And he spent a lot of time looking at pores and cork, and he was also an Austrian monk um, who lived in uh, a monastery where they had these little rooms called cellulae, or uh, I think they were called cellulae. Um, and so that's what he called the, the square little rooms within plant cells. He called them cellulae. Um, and that eventually evolved to be called cells. So cells are the building blocks of all living things. The smallest uh, unit of life is the cell. Okay, so cell theory. There are three tenets currently running. Um, number three is kind of outdated, but the first one is all organisms are made of at least one cell. Cells are the smallest living things. And then the third one is cells come from pre-existing cells. So this is a little bit uh, outdated because we have now been able to create uh, living cellular organisms from scratch. All right, cell size. So. Oh, this is sometimes is a little bit troubling for people when we talk start talking about surface area to volume ratio, uh, but I won't focus too heavily on it. So bacteria are the smallest of cells. So we've got things like atoms, then we go up to our macromolecules, then we go to our um, uh, organelles, and then we have some of our smallest bacteria around 100 nanometers, one to two micrometers. Um, and then we have our egg cells, which are the largest of cells. So if we were to look at, where is the yeah, chicken egg? About 10 centimeters. Um, why so small? I don't understand. What, what am I asking here? Surface area to volume ratio. Let's jump into that. So when you are a teeny weeny cell and you've got, so you're, you're a cell and you're a soup of a lot of different things that all kind of have their own function your things in the center of the cell might need to interact with the things on the outside of the cell. And the things towards you know, the outside of the cell might need to interact with the stuff towards the center of the cell. The smaller cells are actually more efficient at getting things done quickly because there's less space to travel from the outside of the cell, let's say in this case, to the nucleus. Or in this case, so we have a smaller cell less space to travel from the outside of the cell to the inside versus a larger cell. So we have a huge cell. Now there's more space to travel. Cellular processes might take a little bit more time. One thing that's different between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is eukaryotes or things that are nucleated or that have a nucleus, um, they will typically come along with organelles which compartmentalize these cellular processes. So all of the things that need to happen in a certain area but we have them in, trapped in little compartments for them to, to happen versus prokaryotes without nuclei, which are usually smaller, are just kind of like this soup of uh, molecules and organelles, or not organelles, but molecules and enzymes and things that are conducting cellular processes. Now, when it comes to surface area to volume ratio, the larger the cell, the worse the surface area to volume ratio. The smaller the cell, the more surface area to volume ratio there is. So as you get larger in size, the surface area, so surface area would just be the amount of space on the surface of the cell, uh, the volume will actually uh, grow at a faster rate as you become larger than the surface area. 
So as you become smaller, what happens is the volume will shrink faster and the surface area remains a little bit more constant. So smaller cells have better surface area to volume ratio than larger cells. So that's gonna be asked on a test. We don't have to go into the math. I have gone into the math in the past and it just confused people more. Just know that the smaller the cell, the better the surface area to volume ratio. Uh, this is usually a video that I have you guys watch. Um, I'm not gonna go through it here because we know that that just disrupts the whole thing. So just go into the PowerPoint and watch that yourself. It, it shows kind of like um, the, the relative size of things um, from, from viruses up, into, uh, up to eukaryotic cells. Okay, different kinds of cells. So like I said earlier, we got eukaryotes, which are true seeded. They have a nucleus. They also, uh, you will typically have organelles. And then you have prokaryotes, which have no nucleus. So before the true seed. So pro before karyote true seed. So eukaryotes have a nucleus. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. So two different types of uh, prokaryotic cells are bacteria and archaea. And then eukaryotes have eukaryotes eukaryotic type cells. So here's an example of eukaryote uh, with a nucleus and then your prokaryote. So both of them will still have DNA. Uh, however, in your prokaryote, instead of having a compartment to put all the DNA, it's just kind of like this clump, this general region where the DNA is. Now, some other things that are similar between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is, well, one, they have, they both have DNA. So they both have genetic material. They will both have a cytoplasm. So cytoplasm is that juice within the cell. And then they're both going to have a plasma membrane. That's kind of like the border, the, the border of the land um, of the cell. And they're, all gonna, they're also going to have ribosomes. Ribosomes are these things that help you synthesize proteins from mRNA. So those are kind of like the construction workers uh, within, within the cells. Okay, so prokaryotes, no organelles, um, no membranes surrounding the DNA, so no nucleus. They have a nucleoid region, that's what we call uh, the genetic area, uh, genetic stuff area within a prokaryote. And they'll typically have one large circular piece of some, um, or and some smaller circular pieces of DNA. Whereas when we're looking at our DNA, we have linear DNA. So eukaryotes, or we could just use humans, for example, we have linear DNA, whereas most bacteria will have circular DNA. And instead of reproducing via mitosis and uh, cytokinesis, uh, they undergo this process called binary fission, where it's just, they don't really divide their nucleus, they just karate chop down the middle and their cell splits. Their, their genetic material divides but their nucleus doesn't split because they don't have a nucleus. Some specialized external structures that prokaryotes might have are cell walls. So sometimes they'll have cell walls. This is what allows us to stain them. Uh, once you guys go into micro, you'll see how these will stain uh, in a different way uh, than when we, for example, stain our cheek cells uh, because they have cell walls. And they also sometimes have these things called capsules. So that's this sticky substance that allows the the um, cell to stick to surfaces. So we call that a capsule. And then sometimes they'll have flagella. So we've probably heard of flagella. We've you know maybe heard of flagella from knowing that sperm have flagella. They're these little tails, these little tails that whip around for uh, motility. And then they also can sometimes have pili, uh, which are these little hairs that stick out. This allows for horizontal gene transfer between uh, bacteria. So one, it, it'll allow it to attach to surfaces, but it also allows, it, it creates this, it is this tube where you can send your DNA from one bacteria to another bacteria. So no foreplay or anything, here's some DNA, and now you've kind of reproduced, in a sense, by sharing your DNA with another prokaryote. So that's done through pili. Okay, so eukaryotic cells, a little bit more complicated. Uh, like I said earlier, we've got partitions or we have 
compartments within the cell, um, and we call those organelles. So nucleus, all of the DNA stuff should happen within the nucleus, so we have this compartment to keep all of, to store all of that DNA. So everything's within proximity of each other, all the DNA-related things, all the DNA enzymes, all of the DNA itself, where they're within proximity, so they don't have to travel long distances to get to the thing that they need to get to in order to conduct whatever function it needs to do. So we've got a nucleus uh, in our eukaryotic cells. We also come along with some organelles, so little organs. They will perform specific cellular functions. Um, and yeah, so things like genetic control of the cell, uh, manufacturing, distributing, breaking down molecules, energy processing, so that was probably referring to the mitochondria, uh, structural support, movement and communication with surroundings, so that's probably like your cytoskeleton. Um, and your eukaryotic cells will reproduce via mitosis. So mitosis uh, refers to the division of the nucleus. Cytokinesis actually refers to the division of the cell into two cells or the splitting of the cytoplasm. Okay, so eukaryotes, uh, we're not gonna jump too deep into this, but um, so eukaryotes is hypothesized that, oh, sorry, it's hypothesized that um, it is actually kind of fascinating. So the mitochondria within our cells, we've probably heard of this in high school, you know, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Your mitochondria actually are the same shape as bacteria. They have their own DNA, so they their DNA is actually, they carry their own DNA, and their DNA is separate from our DNA, our chromosomes found within our cells, within our nucleus. It's hypothesized that way, way back in the day, you have these early mitochondria-esque organisms, and, you know, way back in the day, we, don't, we also don't have, um, you know, maybe, maybe we don't really have multicellular organisms, for example. Well, we, which would imply that you just have this, that's this land of the many prokaryotes, the many single-celled organisms. And so, you know, within, within this, this world where there's just nothing but prokaryotes to get food, sometimes prokaryotes have to eat other prokaryotes. And so you just, you know, prokaryotes eating other prokaryotes, survival of the fittest among prokaryotes. And so at some point, there may have been a mutation maybe in this larger prokaryote. So it engulfs uh, the mitochondria or it could have been a, a mutation within the mitochondria to give a defense. But regardless, whatever mutation existed at the time allowed the prokaryote that got engulfed by the larger prokaryote, so that early mitochondria that got engulfed by the larger prokaryote, it was actually able to survive. Now this early mitochondria may have been good at just doing one thing, just producing energy. Might not even have known what to do with the energy. It just produced it because it just what it, it's just what it did and maybe it allowed for it to survive or you know gave it some kind of selective advantage. But once it became engulfed by the cell that did not consume it and in fact probably provided it with energy, provided it with precursors to ATP. So things like sugars, for example, it, be, it also gave it a house. So this larger prokaryote gave it a, a kind of a physiological protection from the elements, from the rest of the world. And this little early mitochondria provided this larger cell with ATP. And so from that point forward, you have this mutualistic relationship, this symbiosis where this little thing inside of you is making you a bunch of energy, and all you have to do is simply exist and eat other stuff. And so from there bloomed uh, a lot of complexity. So we're, we hypothesize that this, this is the process that sprouted um, eukaryotes. So with all this extra energy, there's a lot of other things you can do, a lot of other processes that you can you know, use that energy for. And so we call this whole process endosymbiotic theory. I said we wouldn't go too deep into it, but I kind of did. Okay, so cells. Cells, what is this? All cells are general structures. Okay, so we already kind of talked about this. So the commonality between your prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that they all have plasma membranes. 
they all have cytoplasms, they all have ribosomes, so these are kind of like your construction workers, they create proteins, and they all have genetic material. So only your eukaryotes have a nucleus, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. Definitely going to be on the first test. Okay, plasma membrane. So this is, we usually call this a fluid mosaic, um, or we use the fluid mosaic model to describe it. Uh, it's fluid because it's constantly in motion. And so remember, we talked about phospholipids. So these things are always uh, traveling around. They're not static in position. They're exchanging with other phospholipids. You know, these proteins are moving along, you know, within, within the, uh, the cell membrane. And so it's fluid. It's constantly in motion. It's also mosaic mosaic because it's composed of many things. A mosaic painting, for example, a mosaic painting or a mosaic sculpture, for example, is, you know, you, you get up close and it's a bunch of pieces and you might not be able to make out what it is, but then you take a few steps back and you're like, ah, okay, that's a woman on the window or whatever. So the many parts could be things like carbohydrate chains, which um, could be used as like cellular signaling for your other friendly cells. Hey, I'm friendly because I have the specific carbohydrate chain on my cell membrane. Um, you've got proteins that are integrated. Oh, and remember we talked about polar and nonpolar. So nonpolar region of a membrane protein. Of course, it's gonna hang out in this nonpolar area with these um, fatty acid tails, which are also nonpolar. And then maybe the polar areas or the hydrophilic areas of that protein are going to hang out on the outside and on the inside because inside of the cell is water or cytoplasm and ions, etc. Cholesterol, these are also things that are going to be integrated into your cell membrane. And then phospholipids, obviously, those are going to be the base component of our cell membrane. So phospholipids, those are the foundation. Remember, you have your polar hydrophilic heads, water-loving heads, and you have your non-polar hydrophobic tails on the inside. And so it's a bilayer. You got one layer here, you got one layer here. So the, the polar region is facing out, and then the non-polar region is facing in. Yeah, so the head is hydrophilic, tails are hydrophobic. All right, membrane proteins. So, okay, so we got transmembrane. So transmembrane meaning it's traversing. You can just associate the trans with, or the T and the trans with traverse. So it's traversing the entire membrane. It's both outside of the membrane and uh, within the membrane and then within the cell as well. So transmembrane or channel proteins. Those are some things that might hang out within your uh, plasma membrane. Uh, channel proteins that's going to let stuff move in or out of the cell. And then you also have cell surface proteins. So those are things that are embedded into the cell uh, membrane, but not necessarily traversing from outside to within to inside of the cell. So something like this guy right here. So you don't see how he's dangling on the inside. Okay, cytoplasm, the juice of the cell. Uh, we call the liquid part of that juice. Well, so the cytoplasm would be your cytosol, which is the liquid part, your inorganic chemicals, so like your ions, and then also organic molecules. So you have proteins forming a cytoskeleton, for example. So your cytoplasm is just all that junk within the cell that are not organelles specifically, all the non-specific stuff within the cell. And then the cytosol is the liquid part. Ribosomes, like I said, those are your construction workers. So these carry out protein synthesis. Um, we will get into protein synthesis later, but this is a great primer for that. So these are the, these are the things that are going to be taking your messenger mRNA um, and taking that, that transcript. So this is a gene that your cell wants to express and it translates it into a protein. Any, any one of your genes that your cell wants to express is, is pretty much a transcript for a protein, some protein. It's not a transcript that is, is turned into a transcript, but it is some kind of, it is a signal to, to create a protein and ribosomes are what get that done. And remember your proteins, those are uh, composed of amino acids. 
So some are floating around in the cytosol of the cell, and then some of them are bound to this area called the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which I would call um, kind of like the construction site of the, of the cell. Usually it's contiguous with your nucleus, uh, and it, it would make sense that your construction site would be just outside or at least proximal to the area that is telling you to create proteins. Your nucleus is just this database of many different ways to create proteins within the cell. It would make sense that the construction site and the construction workers would hang out right next to it, right next door. So your rough endoplasmic reticulum, like I said, is this ideal environment for protein synthesis. It's, it's the ideal, it's got all the ideal enzymes, it's got all of, it's got the ideal uh, pH for protein folding. Um, and so it's, a, it's just a great construction site. And then your ribosomes are the workers that are actually doing the thing. Okay, genetic material. So deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, is what we will use, what we have as our genetic material. And remember, in prokaryotes, you don't have um, a nucleus. You've got a nucleoid region. In our cells, in our eukaryotic cells, we have a nucleus. Okay, so in the plasma membrane, the phospholipid heads. What is true, I guess, about the phospholipid heads in the plasma membrane? Phospholipid heads. Okay, so A are hydrophilic and face outwards towards the aqueous solution on both sides of the cell membrane. That is true. Let's look at the others. Are hydrophilic? True. Face inward? No. What's facing inward is going to be your uh, phospholipid tails. Are hydrophobic? Phospholipid tails are hydrophobic and face outward towards the aqueous solution. Gosh, I should start making these things like D so I can read through all of these. And then are hydrophobic? No, that's the phospholipid tails. Okay, so the correct answer here is A. Which of the following structures is exclusively associated with prokaryotic cells? Probably nucleoid. Yeah, I was just talking about nucleoid stuff. Nucleoid. They're going to have chromosomes. They're going to have ribosomes. And they're not going to have membrane-bound nucleus. So what makes B or nucleoid correct is that they're exclusively associated with prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotes have chromosomes and ribosomes as well. Okay, so cell city, this is um, something that I've used in the past to help people uh, better understand all of the parts of the cell. Some people like cell city, uh, which is just an analogy between uh, cell parts and city parts. This is the link. Uh, that you can use to watch it. Some people don't really like it. They say it kind of confuses them. So it's, it's up to you. Some people spend so much time trying to uh, learn and memorize the analogy between the parts of a city and the parts of a cell that they kind of lose sight of what we're truly trying to do. And that's just learn the parts of the cell and what they do. So if it works for you, cool. If it doesn't work for you, don't use it. All right, so the nucleus, we can kind of associate that with the control center. Uh, so that contains the cell's DNA, which directs cellular activities or protein synthesis. Within your nucleus, and we might not even get to this in this class, but within your nucleus, you have something called a nucleolus. And your nucleolus is where you have a lot of rRNA, and we'll talk about rRNA uh, much later. The cell membrane that controls what uh, passes into and out of the cells. So that's kind of like the border of your cell. Uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum that makes membrane and uh, makes membrane and proteins. Okay, yeah, sure, yeah, makes membrane, also makes proteins. Uh, it's the ribosomes within the endoplasmic reticulum that are doing it, though. So the rough ER has ribosomes on it. That's what makes it rough. So if you look here, it's kind of studded. Those are the little ribosomes attached to its surface, and then the ribosomes um, attach to the surface of the ER, or they could be free floating within the cytoplasm of the cell. They produce proteins that are secreted and inserted into membranes or transported into ves vesicles uh, to other organelles. So within your rough endoplasmic reticulum, you've got, oh, okay, I thought I had like numbers here. So you have a transcript that, that reaches your uh, ribosome. Your ribosome translates that transcript into protein. 
Your rough ER has ideal folding conditions for your protein. Your protein folds appropriately, and then it's sent out into a vesicle. Now that vesicle, after it's sent out, I hope we talk, we don't talk about the Golgi. We're gonna talk about the Golgi. So once it's sent out of the endo, rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's sent to the post office. Your, your Golgi apparatus or your Golgi complex, I think that's the new word for um, younger, youngins. So your Golgi complex is the post office. This is what repackages. So remember your protein, sorry, where is it? Your, your protein, your protein is stuck in this vesicle. You send this vesicle, hold on. Oh, I'm just scrolling backwards. That vesicle is brought to your Golgi and then your Golgi, what it does is it tags it appropriately to tell it where to go within the cell. Does it need to go to the, to the cell membrane and be secreted out into you know your your bloodstream for example or or outside of the cell or does it need to be transported to like a specific organelle it'll tag it with the appropriate tag it'll put the stamp on it to send it to a different area of the cell so that's what your golgi complex does this is the post office so it finishes sorts and ships the cell products uh, they'll receive and modify endoplasmic reticulum products and ship them to other organelles okay and we talked about the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, what, what made the rough endoplasmic reticulum rough was the ribosomes. Your smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not have any ribosomes stuck to it, therefore making it smooth. Uh, the main function of this is going to be making lipids and carbs and also detox. So you're going to actually find, if, when you look at your hepatocytes or the, the livers, or the livers of your cell, the, the cells of your liver, uh, you'll actually find that they, they contain a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. That's because your liver is heavily involved in the detoxification process. Okay, oh, we do talk about the nucleolus. So this is where you make the ribosome. So within your nucleus, you have an area that's dedicated to making ribosomes. So here you're going to find a lot of rRNA. Um, your, your ribosomes are composed of protein and rRNA. So that was another uh, function of RNA that I missed uh, in chapter one, I think, when we talked about it, or maybe it was chapter two. Okay, cytoplasm, so everything from the plasma membrane to the nucleus of the cell. So the outside of the cell to the nucleus, that's your cytoplasm. It's a clear gel liquid, or the clear gel liquid is cytosol. And what your cytoplasm does is it suspends all of your organelles. It is, it is kind of like the land of your kingdom. Okay. Mitochondria. So the mean is that they're the powerhouse of the cell. What they do is they harvest chemical energy from food. So they carry out this, this process called cellular respiration, uh, which is used to break down things like sugar uh, into, which is a type of potential energy, into ATP. So they, they're generating ATP. Usually ATP is pretty short-lived um, as soon as it's made as well. So, uh, so to break down the, or to look at, look at the anatomy of a mitochondria, they've got an outer membrane, and they also have an inner membrane. And then you have this zigzag uh, kind of complex on the inside. We call that the matrix. These folds themselves, we call those cristae. So crista would be a single fold, and then cristae would be the plural uh, version of them. And the reason for these cristae is to increase the surface area. So if you think about it, when you're looking at, like, let's say the outside of a cell, you've got all of these proteins lined up. Some of them are enzymes, some of them are just transporters. Um, and so you, you have like kind of a limited space on the outside of your cell to, to implant all of these, they could be receptors, they could be uh, whatever. Well, within here, you've got, you know, your mitochondria are responsible for the majority of your energy production. And so they're kind of loaded with enzymes 
that are conducting all of these processes to make ATP. And so they need lots of room for those enzymes. And what they do is they embed them into this inner membrane. And we're actually in, in the, next, the next section, we're going to look at, we're going to talk about the enzymes involved. Um, but they load these enzymes and these proteins involved in making ATP into this inner membrane. And so they need as much surface area as they can get. Lots of folds. Okay. Chromosomes. So that's just your the form of your protein or that or form of your protein. This is your DNA. This is your genetic material. They 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 exist in the form of chromosomes. So in a non-dividing cell, they're going to be in the form of chromatin. So chromatin, oh I wish I could draw this. So chromosomes, you could just associate chromosomes with your genetic material. The form that they are in when your cell's not dividing, which we'll cover in the section after the next section, uh, is chromatin form. So it's just kind of like this detangled spaghetti uh, that's kind of, it's, it's decondensed so that it's, it's easily used uh, for gene expression. Okay, chloroplasts. So if we're talking about anything that photosynthesizes, um, they're going to usually contain chloroplasts, and what those do is they convert solar energy into chemical energy. So they're found in plants and some protists, and what they, yeah, they convert solar energy into chemical energy uh, in, in the form of sugars. So they convert solar energy to chemical energy in the form of sugars. And we're going to go into great detail about how they do that later. Lysosomes, those are like your digestive compartments, the recycle bins. Um, they're just sacks of digestive enzymes. So if you look here, let's say you've got um, something made in your rough endoplasmic reticulum. You got a bunch of proteins in here, sent to the Golgi and uh, processed by the Golgi. And it looks like the Golgi could send it in two directions. So you send it in this direction. Here it is. Here's this sack. We don't know what's in it. Also, simultaneously, your cell is engulfing something from the outside. So it phagocytoses something, maybe food. It's brought into the cell, it's combined with this sac, and it looks like it's digested. So likely what was made here was a lysosome. Breaks it down, consumes it, breaks down that food into its base components so we can use it for something else. Here's another option. Oh, look, we have a dysfunctional mitochondria, and we need to engulf it and, and recycle it for parts. Fuse, its, fuse it with a, with a lysosome, and now we can, we, that's loaded with enzymes to break everything down. Now we can harvest it for its parts. All right, here we go, look. Transport vesicle containing uh, inactive hydrolytic enzymes, Golgi, lysosome, so they're activated now. Engulfing of a particle, and we get digestion. Lysosome engulfing damaged organelle. So if something gets damaged in your cell, just recycle it, use its parts. Also, another fun fact is your mitochondria will divide independently of your cell. So your mitochondria can divide, 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 divide by their own will, while our cell is kind of doing its own thing by its own will. Now, over you know a long time, they've kind of co-evolved to kind of know what the other is doing, so so to maximize their I know I don't know energy production or or efficiency. Um, so we actually have a lot of uh, mitochondrial genes within our DNA. So and and our mitochondria have a lot of genes that allow it to coexist with us too. And so we have these 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 genes that are that allow us to be friendly uh, to each other, so that no harm is done to either party. True uh, mutualistic symbiosis. All right, so vacuoles, this is another thing that you'll probably find mostly in plants. Um, and so they function, they have these, these things have tons of function. So uh, sometimes, like if you're talking about protists, some protists will have a vacuole. Uh, they'll use that to kind of project themselves, to, to kind of use as, it's a, it's a sack filled with water. And if you press it, if you compress it, it'll shoot out water until you can move. Now in plants, you know they've got a vacuole and what this what this does is it stores water it can store starch it can store um, pigment it can store poison 
Um, so the, the, there's lots of functions. It also really depends on the plant as well, if we're talking about plants. But yeah, so it has lysosomal and storage functions. So this is a plant cell. Notice how the vacuole takes up the majority of the cell and the nucleus is kind of scrunched off to the side. These green little sacs, these are your chloroplasts. And what gives this cell, it's, you know, it's still rigid and kind of rectangular, that's your cell wall giving it its rigidity. So if you have a fully filled up vacuole, then your cell would become more taut. All right, cytoskeleton. So um, we got three different types of cytoskeleton. This is like, you know, our skeleton kind of dictates our, it, it determines our structure uh, as humans. Um, it gives us that structural support. So within our cells, they kind of have their own skeletal structure. Uh, and they have three different types of skeleton material. So you've got microfilaments. So these are going to be the smallest filaments, the, fall the smallest skeletal material of the cell, uh, composed of actin, and they're very thin, and they're dynamic, so they're constantly moving. Usually you're going to find actin towards the perimeter, the outer perimeter, or the inner perimeter of the cell. Then you have intermediate filaments, which are actually um, intermediate in size. And these are kind of like thick rope. What these do is they hold all of your organelles in place. So they're, they're kind of the, the backbone of everything. They are what uh, hold your organelles in place. And then you have microtubules. These are kind of like the highway system. I know that when you, if, you, if you end up watching the, the video on uh, Cell City, I think they call the endoplasmic reticulum the highway system. But microtubules are kind of like the highway system because there are these tubes. So when you when your cell needs to transport some something in a vesicle from one place to another, they transport it in a vesicle. Now this vesicle doesn't just float from one place to another. What it does is it's carried on these microtubules from one area to another. So these are like the highway systems. That's how you transport your stuff. If you're ever looking at like a neuron you know, you have to transport everything from the cell body to that axon terminal. They travel along the, the microtubules uh, of the axon. Okay, cell walls. One thing to note is they're not in animal cells. So don't get that confused. Uh, you're going to find them in bacteria. You'll find them in plants, fungi, protists, not in animal cells. So cell walls, they give your cell rigidity. And this is going to be found on the outside of your cell membrane. So all cells are gonna have cell membrane. So just because you have a cell wall doesn't mean you don't have a cell membrane. If you're a plant cell, you're going to have a cell wall as well as a plasma membrane. Okay, things involved in cell movement. So you got flagella, its tail is composed of microtubule. Cilia, they're also composed of uh, microtubules, but those are gonna be like short filaments. So here you look at the sperm, it's got this long flagella, and then you look at this protist here, and it's got a bunch of cilia. So cilia allow things to kind of like walk along a surface or move things up. Um, you know, in your upper respiratory tract, you have a lot of cilia that help move debris up, and then you, you, know, you cough and spit it out. Flagella is usually like if you're if you are a single-celled organism, you will have one flagella or maybe two flagella, and they just kind of help you move along a little bit faster. Okay, endomembrane system. The endomembrane system encompasses uh, your smooth ER, your rough ER, and your Golgi apparatus. That's all this is. We're not going to deep dive too much into the endomembrane system. It's kind of just semantic, anyways. Okay, so animal. Animal versus plant cells. So, like we compared the, you know, we compared the eukaryotic cells to the prokaryotic cells. The biggest difference is that we have a nucleus; they do not. However, when we're looking at animal cells versus plant cells, we both have nuclei. Both have nuclei. Instead of going down this list, these are all the things that we have in common because we're both eukaryotes. One thing that plant cells will have are cell walls. They may have vacuoles, and they may have chloroplasts. So that's how you differentiate between a plant cell and an animal cell. 
Your plant cells will have cell walls, chloroplasts, and maybe vacuoles. Okay, which of the following cell structures are associated with the breakdown of harmful substances? Oh, man, quarter after quarter, I keep forgetting to add this to the PowerPoint. So this is peroxisomes. We're not going to go into too much detail regarding it. Um, yeah, peroxisomes. Okay, cell processes. Okay, so we're going to touch a little bit on Chapter 5. Um, so this is going to be a Chapter 4 slash... A wee bit of chapter five, but we're going to uh, go heavier into chapter five later. Next uh, section. Okay, so this is just an excerpt from the study guide. So this is going to be on your your test one. Okay, so this was just a video for me to like re reiterate what the the cell membrane does. It's a fluid mosaic model. Um, it's got, you know, it's fluid because it's constantly moving and interchanging those phospholipids. And it's also a mosaic because it's composed of many parts, but it has one coherent form when you take a step out. Okay, so let's talk about diffusion. So you drop a sugar cube into some water, and what happens is, let's say all the sugar particles are orange and all the water molecules are blue. Uh, what happens is your orange molecules or your sugar has the tendency to move towards where there is less of itself. We call this diffusion. And so over time, the, the sugar molecules will move to where there's less of itself or there's just simply more water. And so over time, eventually your, your uh, solution should become homogenous. However, there's, there's a speed difference uh, between the beginning of this process and the end of this process. So the steeper the concentration gradient, here the concentration gradient is very steep because you have a high density of sugar here and a high density of water over here. So the steeper the concentration gradient, the faster the rate of diffusion. But once you've gotten here and it's a little bit diluted, so your sugar you know, molecules are a little bit diluted relative to the initial stage, is going to be a little bit slower. So the less steep the concentration gradient, the slower the rate of diffusion. Okay, so diffusion, that's just the movement of stuff from a higher concentration of itself to a lower concentration of itself. Now when we're talking about osmosis, we're talking about the movement of water. So let's say you have a beaker, and we could just use sugar as, as an example again. These little purple dots here, let's say that sugar and this pink stuff here is this water. So we have a beaker, and like our cell membranes, um, we use a film that is semi-permeable. And which I should define semi-permeable, I don't. So, oh, well, yeah, I don't define it. So semi-permeable membranes, those are membranes that allow uh, only certain things to move through. So our cells in our cell membranes of our cells uh, have semi or they have semi permeable membranes. So only some things can move through and some things cannot. So let's just say, you know, larger molecules, larger polar molecules can't move through, but we allow water to move through. And that's actually true. We let water move through a lot easier than any other thing uh, within our cell membrane. So let's say we have this hypothetical semi permeable membrane separating both regions of this beaker and we fill it up with water so that it's equal on both sides. The level of water is equal on both sides. However, on this right side, we have way more sugar. So if we let it sit over time, uh, this, this process happens called osmosis. So kind of like the fusion where the stuff wants to be around where there's less of itself, this water has the tendency to move to where there's less of itself. And so this water moves to diffuse this sugar through a process called osmosis. So osmosis is defined as, as water movement through a semi-permeable membrane from an area with lower concentration of solute to an area of higher solute concentration. So solute is the stuff that is becoming dissolved. So water moves from an area with lower concentration of solute to an area with higher concentration of solute. So this is diffusion, or it's not diffusion, osmosis. This is diffusion. So this is the movement of solute. That's diffusion. The movement of water, we're talking about osmosis. Okay, so this is just a general breakdown that I, that I had in case it was a little bit confusing. As a general rule of thumb, stuff tends towards dispersion. 
Stuff wants to be diluted by solvent, or in this case water, and water wants to dilute stuff. So in this case, water wants to dilute stuff. This stuff wants to be where there is less of itself. Okay, transport across the membrane. So membranes are selectively permeable, like I said. Um, some substances are nonpolar and small polar. So things that are nonpolar and small polar molecules like water can cross and other larger polar cannot without assistance. So nonpolar substances. So things like, like alcohol could be a good example. Some of our drugs are nonpolar. They just slip right through our cell membrane because they're nonpolar because the majority of our cell membranes are actually nonpolar. If you think about it, those phospholipid heads were kind of small relative to the size of the, the dangling tails, uh, which take up much more space. And so if more of the membrane is nonpolar, well, it's going to attract more nonpolar stuff. And so more nonpolar stuff is going to make it into at least the membrane. And if it's in the membrane, then it could probably easily cross over into the cell. And then small polar, so if they can just slip right through the, um, you know, each of those phospholipids like water, then it can cross the, the membrane. However, larger stuff usually has trouble moving through. Okay, so selective diffusion, this is... This is another, we have a few terms that we're going to learn here. So selective diffusion is where there is no protein transport. You're going to move from high concentration. So brackets typically mean concentration. So high concentration to low concentration without protein transport. So let's say, you know, this is, we could even use water. No, let's not use water. Let's just, let's use ethanol, for example. So these are, uh, what can we use? Glucose. These are glucose, these are very large glucose, or we could even say, you know, sucrose. So to make them even larger, these are sucrose molecules. And then this is, these are just little ethanol particles. And so what happens is what, you know, how we define selective diffusion is, well, this stuff will just bounce off the membrane, it's too large. However, this smaller nonpolar stuff moves right into the cell. So some molecules can cross the membrane while others cannot. We call that selective diffusion. So that's just something that we uh, can kind of use to describe our cell membranes as well. So solute diffusion from uh, high concentration of solute to low concentration of solute. We also have this term called facilitated diffusion. So here we have the word facilitated. So some things like glucose, for example, wasn't able to make it through the membrane inherently. It bounces off. However, we'll probably have some channels embedded because we want glucose in the cell. We probably have some channels within the cell that allows specifically glucose or whatever large molecule it is to move through with ease, through a diffusion. So they're going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So you have you know, these glucose molecules on the outside. You have this channel that's perfectly shaped to bring glucose in, but nothing else. So we call that facilitated diffusion. Diffusion because it's moving from high concentration to low concentration. Okay, larger molecules, polar molecules, things that normally wouldn't be able to move through the membrane inherently, we usually use facilitated diffusion to get that through if it's vital, if it's a vital substance. All right, now we have active transport. So this is where we're moving against the concentration gradient. So let's say, um, what's a good example actually? Glucose was like the perfect example because we actually have a lot of active transport to get glucose into the cell. Um, active transport, you're moving, let's say you want something in the cell, but you already have a lot of it inside of the cell. You're going to use active transport to move that thing into the cell. And so this is just showing you how, let's say, you already have a bunch of hydrogen on the outside of the cell, and you have a very small amount of hydrogen on the inside of the cell. By diffusion principles, your hydrogen is gonna have the tendency, it's gonna really wanna be in here because there's less of itself in here than there is out here. However, through active transport, because we want it more acidic outside of the cell, we want more hydrogens outside of the cell, we will use active transport so active transport uses energy. So through the use of ATP, 
we are able to pump this hydrogen where there is a very small amount of it to an area where there is a lot of it already. So we pump it, we pump it against nature and we use, we have to use energy to do that. We call that active transport. Okay. So there's three ways we've covered, three ways we've covered so far that gets, that stuff can get through a cell membrane. I'm gonna work on my English. Some things can diffuse through the membrane without aid. So high concentration to low concentration, so that would be diffusion. Some things can diffuse through the membrane with the assistance of specialized channel, but requires no energy. So you're moving from high concentration to low concentration, that would be facilitated diffusion. So this is, you know, diffusion, basic diffusion facilitated diffusion and then some things use both a specialized transporter and energy energy is the main thing here energy when you think energy too, think ATP so the A and ATP should be associated with active and active transport so um, some things use both a specialized transporter and energy in order to make it across the membrane against its concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration of solute active transport active transport uses ATP energy. Okay, almost there. So transport across the membrane. So here's some ways we can get stuff in or yeah. So endocytosis is the way we get stuff in. That's the general umbrella term of bringing anything into the cell. If you're bringing solids in, we call that phagocytosis. If we're pulling liquids in, we call that pinocytosis. So think Pinot Noir, the type of wine, uh, pinocytosis is bringing liquids, phagocytosis is bringing solids into the cell. Exocytosis, so exit. Exocytosis brings solids or liquids out of the cell from within it. All right, almost there. Which of the following processes can move a solute against its concentration gradient? Against its concentration gradient. Osmosis moves water um, from a lower concentration of solute to a place with higher concentration of solute, that's moving with its concentration gradient through a semi-permeable membrane. Water is going to move, you know, where there is uh, a lower concentration of non-self to an area of higher concentration of non-self. It wants to be around non-self. Passive transport, that's just going to be you drop a sugar cube uh, into some water and it passively diffuses to make a homogeneous solution. And then we have facilitated diffusion. So this is gonna be, you know, you wanna get a specific ion into the cell. You have a lot of sodium on the outside, but it can't make it through the, the membrane on its own. So you have the specialized channel that brings it in um, and allows it to just diffuse from higher concentration to lower concentration gradient. And then active transport, you're moving something against its concentration gradient through the use of ATP. So D would be the correct answer here.